in her recent book, The Ballot in the Bible, How Scripture Has Been Used and Abused in American Politics. Caitlin Scheiss writes this. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7, is the quintessential political passage. Then she goes on to give several examples how this text has been used in our nation's history. During the Revolutionary War, clergy who were loyalist to England quoted this text to argue honor and submission to the King of England. More recently, it was used against the 2016 Black Lives Matter protest, most notably by Robert Jeffress, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas. Former U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions quoted this text in defense of the Trump administration separating immigrant children from their parents at the U.S. border. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, Romans 13 verses 1 through 7 was cited by Christians against churches that disobeyed local meeting restrictions or mask mandates. So this is an important text for us to read, to study, to consider, to reflect upon, and hopefully apply to our own lives today. But listen to what uh, several New Testament scholars warn about this text. Michael Gorman in his commentary. Romans 13 verses 1 through 7 is is among the most difficult, potentially disturbing, and even possibly dangerous of all Pauline texts. Over the centuries, it has too often been used to to support the divine right of kings, blind nationalism, and unquestioned loyalty to rulers, even tyrants. Scott McKnight, in his Everyday Study Bible series, writes this. In the history of the church, this text, whether by those in political power or by those with power over the enslaved, this passage has been used and abused with uh, tragic results. In her brand new commentary on Romans, Beverly Roberts Gaventa writes, these seven verses rank among the most difficult in a letter that overflows with interpreted challenges. Well, So this text, again, has been used, and in the opinion of some, even abused by Christians throughout the history of Christianity. And so as we consider this text this morning, I want us, first of all, to think about its context in the entire epistle of Romans, then look at its immediate context, within the letter itself, read the text, and then spend just a few minutes unpacking this text, and then try to make some application as we are in this election season, as it approaches, to hopefully better inform us and help us as Christians. So, the context of Romans Paul most likely wrote Romans from Corinth, where he stayed at the end of his third missionary journey. We can read about this in Romans 15, as well as Acts chapter 20, before he traveled to Jerusalem. The date would be A.D. 57, and we know from the end of the book of Acts, Paul would eventually make it to Rome in about A.D. 60. The purpose of the letter seems to be primarily diplomatic. Paul is seeking to establish rapport and build a social network in preparation for his visit to Rome, during which he will not only preach and teach, but also solicit support for his anticipated mission to Spain. We know that from Romans chapter 15, 
verses 24 and 28. And in order to establish this rapport, Paul does several things in this letter. Because it seems very clear from chapters 14 and 15 that Paul was writing to a somewhat divided church in Rome. There must have been some conflict between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Chapters 14 and 15 address that directly. So, to establish this rapport, Paul spends the first 11 chapters of this letter to discuss theology, to discuss doctrine, to define this gospel that he declares in the introduction to the letter to be the power of God unto salvation. And so for 11 chapters, he talks about this great news, this good news. Jesus coming into this world to do something for us that we could not do ourselves. And that is to receive forgiveness of our sins. To establish fellowship with our Creator once again. And to bring Jew and Gentile together in the body of Christ. But Paul also has not just a theological concern, but also a pastoral concern. Even though he has never visited Rome, even though he may not know any of the Christians in the imperial city of Rome, he feels a closeness. He feels a bond with these Christians. And so, after developing this theological treatise, if you will, he gets very practical. He's concerned about the way they are living out their faith. He is concerned about how they are treating one another. And that may often carry over in their relationship with those who were not Christians, as well as the Roman government. So, it's theological in nature, it's pastoral in nature, and it's missional in nature. As, once again, Paul is, is trying to establish a relationship with these Christians. Well, that's a brief introduction to kind of the overview of Romans. But let's look at the immediate context in which chapter uh, 13, verses 1 through 7 her. I believe that its immediate context begins in Romans chapter 1, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and continues through chapter 13 and verse 14. We all can quote, I think, Romans 12 and verse 1. It begins with the word therefore. And the therefore of chapter 12 verse 1 may be the most important, therefore, in the letter. Because what Paul is about to write is based on what has preceded, that is, his exposition and defense of the gospel. So beginning in chapter 12, verse 1, Paul transitions from the theological to the practical, from the indicative to the imperative, from what we should believe to how we should behave from what God has given to us through the sacrifice of Jesus to what we now as disciples of Jesus give to God. And I think what Paul is doing here in this context is impressing upon us that our theology, those things that we believe, is to be a lived theology. An embodied life lived together in fellowship with other people as we seek to be disciples together of Jesus. So what does this embodied life look like? Well, chapter 12, verse 1. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Chapter chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. We humbly serve using our individual giftedness for the body of Christ. 
Chapter 12, verse 16, we live in harmony with one another. Chapter 12 and verse 18, we should live at peace with everyone. Chapter 13 and verse 9, we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Chapter 13 and verse 13, we are to practice sexual morality. And this section concludes in verse 14 with Paul saying we are to clothe ourselves or we are to put on Christ. So this context, chapter 12, verse 1, through chapter 13 and verse 14, Paul is very practical. This is what our faith in Jesus lived out is to look like. And that was just a few examples that I shared from these two chapters. And so our text this morning... Our political word from Paul occurs in this very practical section. And it's embedded within not only getting along with one another, but getting along with everyone. Not only loving one another and living in harmony with one another, but not retaliating, not seeking revenge. In in fact, loving our enemy. So before we read the text, I want to return once again to Michael Gorman. And here is what Gorman writes in his introduction and his commentary to this section. Since the views expressed in Romans 13 are often labeled conservative, especially in comparison to Revelation 13, it is important at the outset to recall what we've noted noted at various points in the commentary, that the gospel Paul proclaims had an inherently anti-imperial thrust. Jesus and Caesar cannot both rule the universe. Thankful the, the hymn that Tim led a moment ago. Jesus, Jesus is Lord. This dimension of the gospel will mean that Paul cannot in any way espouse blind nationalism, hyper-patriotism, or an uncritical stance toward political authorities. So those are some of the things that I think we need to keep in mind as we now come to the text. So let's read Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Reading from the NIV this morning. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free uh, from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. All right, let's go back and and unpack this text uh, just a little bit. And I don't have time to say everything that I maybe would like to say uh, about this text because we got to make application here uh, in just a minute. But the primary imperative in these seven verses Uh, is found in verse 1 and verse 5, where the NIV reads, be subject 
to governing authorities. Uh, other translators uh, use submit. So be in submission to governing authorities. The word that's translated to subject or to submit uh, literally means to, to order yourself under. All right? Most commentators will make the point that th this is not the word obey. Paul reserves the word obey in the letter to the Romans uh, to use in reference to God, to the gospel, our obedience uh, to Christ. And so we are to subject ourselves or submit ourselves, order ourselves under the governing authorities. Why? Well, Paul gives us at least three reasons. Number one, he says they are ordained by God. And to rebel against them is to rebel against God. And to rebel is to be subject to punishment. So the first reason Paul says to submit or to subject yourselves to the governing authorities is because God's the one who put them there. Right? And so we, when we subject ourselves to God, or, or excuse me, the governing authorities, in reality, we are submitting ourselves to God. A second reason that Paul gives for subjecting ourselves is found in verse 3. Because they are rewarders of good and avengers of evil. And so Paul says in this text, the reason God has ordained or set up, ordered governments is to reward good and to punish evil. And I, I love how Paul puts this in such practical terms. You know, uh, if you don't want to receive the wrath of the government, then be good. Be good. If you aren't good in your relationship to the government, well, that's when you need to be fearful, right? So they are rewarders of good and avengers of evil. And then a third reason, uh, Paul says, that we are to subject, our, subject ourselves to governing authorities is because in verses 4 and 5, he says they are God's servants, now, you might remember several weeks ago that wonderful series that we had on deacons. Nobody remembers that wonderful series uh, on deacons. But in one of those sermons, I, I shared how often this word diakonos occurs. And here, Paul uses it in verses 4 and 5 in reference to to these governing authorities. They are God's servants, or they are God's deacons. They have a job to fulfill. They are agents, as we defined that word in that wonderful series several weeks ago. They are agents of, of God, which means they are responsible to God. Now, you might find some other reasons embedded within this text as to why Paul says we need to subject ourselves to the governing authorities. But here are, there are at least three that we've identified. Right? So we get to, uh, to verse 6. And now Paul gives an example of how we can subject or submit ourselves to the governing authorities. And that's through the paying of taxes. In fact, Gorman, in his commentary, argues that that's the primary point of this text. Evidently, Paul had received word that for whatever reason or reasons, there were some Roman Christians who were not paying their taxes. Well, again, let me give a little historical context for this. At the time Paul wrote this letter, Nero was the emperor of the Roman Empire. He began to reign in about AD 54 until he committed suicide in 68. And history tells us 
that Nero mitigated heavy taxation upon the Roman Empire, which again, uh, Paul urges these Christians of Rome to pay taxes. And so it might be that's what's in the back of Paul's mind. The precarious situation for Christians, and especially Jewish Christians returning to Rome, We know from Acts chapter 18, as well as Roman historians, that the emperor Claudius had expelled or driven Jews out of Rome previously. And when Nero became emperor, he relaxed that edict, and so Jews were allowed to return. And as we learned last week from our word from Jesus, Jews didn't like paying taxes to the Roman government. And so here now these Christians, Gentile Christians as well as uh, Jewish Christians, are in Rome. They're being heavily taxed, and they are already having to be careful because of their conversions to Jesus, the, the pressures, the disturbances that might have been provoked because of their new faith, not only with family, but friends, and even uh, the government, it made, it made the situation there in Rome very tense. But, again, Paul reminds them that governing authorities are God's ministers. Here, in verse 6, he uses a different word than diakonos. It's uh, the word that we've discussed in the past, that was often used in the Greek Old Testament to refer to priest. So it's just another example of Paul emphasizing upon these Christians in Rome that governing authorities will be responsible to God. They belong to God. And so this text concludes with somewhat of an additional obligation, if you will, when Paul says, give to everyone what you owe them. L- literally, the Greek is kind of rough. It reads, give back, which is the same word we saw last week in Matthew twenty-two twenty-one from Jesus. Give back to all the debts. So if, if you have any debt, whatever it might be, give back to all. And he gives four examples, tax, revenue, respect, and honor. So, what are some implications from this text that might help us as Christians today in the political environment in which we live? Number one, God remains above all political authority or powers. I love what N.T. Wright and Michael Byrd write about this particular text in their recent little book, Christ and the Powers. They say, God alone is authority. God alone is authority. Governments only have authority. Big difference there. God alone is. That's present tense, and it's perpetual. God alone as our creator is the authoritative one. Governments only have authority as he ordains, Paul says. Number two, God's desire for all governing authorities is for peace and justice. When the Romans conquered the world, they were very proud of the fact that they had established, as they put it, Pax Romana, Roman peace. Now, they created that peace through being very vicious to their enemies. But there was this sense in the Roman Empire now, uh, there was relative peace, at least Rome had provided some roads, some highways in which people could travel. They had uh, established some economic 
peace, uh, we might say. And so Paul here implies that in this particular text. And so that's, that's God's desire, not just for the Roman government in uh, the first century A.D., but for all governments. Again, to reward good and to punish uh, evil. Number three, when governing authorities resist being servants of God for the good of, of society, they become subject to God's judgment. That is, I think, somewhat obvious uh, of an implication in this text. Governments need to be aware that they exist because they are servants of God. And when they cease to act like representatives of God, they are subject to God's government or judgment. So number four, our relationship to the government could be characterized as conscientious citizenship. Right? Um, again, the majority of, of commentators really point out uh, how somewhat unusual what Paul says at the end of verse five that it's necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. You might remember two weeks ago, in the very first lesson, our introductory word to this uh, subject, I made the point that all of us have to respond politically as our conscious dictates. Now, the word conscious isn't, it's not found that often in the New Testament. Paul uses it more than any other New Testament writer. And in other places, he talks about having a good conscious. And I think, based upon those contexts, Paul would say that a good conscious is one that has been taught and trained by the Word of God. Right? And so, we are to be very conscious. We are to be very aware. We are to be very knowledgeable of the culture and the society in which we live. And we must be sure that as we act as our conscious dictates, that we are doing so as one who has been taught and trained by the Word of God. So number five, with that in mind, being subject or submitting to the governing authorities is determined by what is being demanded of us. There are examples in the Old Testament. Uh, four that I can think of immediately are Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the New Testament, we have examples in the first few chapters of Acts of Peter and John and the rest of the apostles, making it very clear not only to the Jewish authorities but also the Roman authorities in ancient Jerusalem that they had to obey God rather than men. And so again, this, this submitting uh, is determined by what is being demanded of us by those governing authorities. So number six, though governing authorities are worthy of respect, they are not divine. Only God is. Only our Lord Jesus is. And so with that, with that in mind, it challenges us to keep the governing authorities, our own government, uh, political personalities in their proper place. Servants of God, ministers of God, but not divine. They're not the ultimate authority. Only God is. And then finally, as Gorman suggests in a portion I read uh, just a moment ago from his commentary, Romans 13 
must be held in tension with Revelation 13. Both of these texts, I believe, are about Rome. One, Romans 13, says to be a good citizen. Revelation 13 says, resist the empire. And so again, we're back to being conscious of the society and the culture in which we live. I believe uh, this whole section that began in chapter 12, verse 1, and ends in chapter uh, 13, verse 14, can be summarized by a little statement that Paul makes at the beginning of chapter 13 and verse 13. The NIV reads, let us behave decently. Other translations read, walk honestly, live properly, conduct ourselves honorably. The word that uh, is translated there means to be of good repute, to be of high standing, to be noble in our character. And I believe that's the bottom line for Paul. As Christians in a very difficult culture and society in which to live, but particularly in an election year, to behave decently, to conduct ourselves with high moral character. So as we begin to conclude this series, we'll look at a word from Peter next week, from 1 Peter chapter 2. And then the series will end two weeks from today with a lesson on unity. And that's when we'll really talk about behaving decently. And especially in our relationship with one another.